Good day, viewers, and welcome once again to The Bible Speaks. My name is Ron Hector. I'm the minister at the Church of Christ at Richland Park. We always continue to give God thanks and praise for every situation, every circumstances that he has brought us to and through. And we continue to thank him for life and all that we continue to do here in beautiful SVG. As I mentioned last week, um, and I pray and hope and trust that you know, you didn't take me to come over as being cynical because I wasn't. But indeed, just when, you know, you start seeing signs that things are getting better, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we get in the hand of the things that basically add values, you know, to life. Then up comes the devil who, you know, he just come beating on our door, reminding us that this is not us. This is not us. He is reminding us that, you know, we are basically hell-bent on destroying one another. And, hey, you, you need to stick to the script. Stick with the script, not the scriptures. And sadly, sticking with the script, we are. Again, we have countless numbers of individuals who have allowed themselves to be deceived by the devil. To be deceived by the devil. The way we treat one another, the way we behave towards one another. And again, coming back to scriptures, allowing themselves to be deceived by the devil into believing that they're serving God when in fact they're only serving themselves. The question we ask is what is going on in your life right now? Is it really about serving God? Or is it about serving self? We looked at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to verse 23. Again, Jesus looked at the judgment day and he spoke about those souls who allow themselves to be deceived. Again, he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, listen to the words of Jesus. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Of mercy is 2021 and we still are not listening to what Jesus Christ is saying. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that, what? <laughs> That's the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Many, he says, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name, we've cast out devils. In thy name, we've done many wonderful works. And Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity, you who work lawlessness. Jesus said that many would tell him about all the religious things they had done, about all the wonderful things that they had done. And his response would be, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, all you were doing was practicing lawlessness. Serving self and not doing God's will. They were not doing the will of the Father. They were doing what they wanted in religion. Has anything changed today? Sadly, no. We're still all about pleasing self and not recognizing when we do this, our religion, what we offer up to God, is just useless. It's useless because we are seemingly honoring and seemingly glorifying God. But as Jesus said, our heart is just far from him. Far from him. Again, we saw God give us the scriptures to make us wise for salvation, wise unto salvation. The scripture is there to teach us, to reprove us, to correct us, to train us in righteousness. The scripture equips us for every good work. And indeed, God has given us a pattern for us to follow. He's given us a blueprint of how to serve him. But Satan wants us to just minimize it. Throw it through the window. Forget about it. He wants to convince us that the pattern in scripture is not important. Do what you want. Do as you like. 
We ended last week by looking at various statements we use to minimize God's pattern. And all we end up doing is exalting our own opinions, exalting our own desires. Statement like, you know, we all go into heaven, we're just taking different ways to get there. Mm -hmm. Statement like, you know, God just really wants us to be happy. So if what we're doing feels good, then it must be pleasing to God. And statement like, I know what the Bible says, but I just can't believe God is going to condemn me for this. Again, the service we offer God must be authorized and it must be approved by his pattern, the scriptures. So as we continue, I want to now appeal to our sense of reasoning. I want to appeal to our sense of reasoning. Now, every one of us, every living human being, is very much aware of the fact that light shines best in what? I can just hear you say it in darkness. Yeah, that's true. Everybody knows that. Light shines best in darkness. If you were to walk into a dark room and you turn on the switch. Now the darkness does not roll up in a corner and just relax until the switch is turned off and then it comes back up. Does that happen? Have you ever seen that happen? You turn on the light switch and all of a sudden the darkness says, you know what, too much light here, let me go over here and relax a while. And you see light and darkness in the same room. That don't happen. You see, the darkness completely disappears. Why? Because light dispels darkness. That's how it works. So using darkness to combat darkness is no more effective than asking, you know, Satan to correct sin. It's not going to work. And I'm reminded of Paul's encouragement to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 17, Paul says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord. He says to them that you henceforth walk not as the Gentile walk. How? In the vanity of their mind. He says, having their understanding darkened. This is how the Gentiles walked in the vanity of their mind. He says their understanding were darkened. They were alienated from the life of God through the ignorance, he says, that was in them. They were alienated from the life that is in God because of the blindness, he says, of their heart. In verse 19, Paul says, Who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. And here's the encouragement he gives to the church in Ephesus. He says to them, but you have not so learned Christ. In no way, in God's word, do you find such atrocity, such behavior. You have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, he says that, you know, put off concerning the former conversation, put off that old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And then he says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, we are the light of the world. And we cannot afford to get caught up in the darkness. I mean, come on, we have a light to shine. You cannot find darkness with darkness. It don't work. So, question. Does God really care about what we do as long as we say, you know, we are honoring and glorifying Him? Does God really care about what we do as long as we say we are honoring God and we are glorifying God. Does it matter to God what we do? You see, we may become 
indifferent as human beings. We do. We do become indifferent. We just couldn't care less about certain things, various things. Some people just couldn't care less about anything. So we do become indifferent to God. We do become indifferent to his word. But I want to assure you at this point in time that God has and will always take his word serious. We may become indifferent to his word, but God always take his word serious. You see, God desires and God expects our obedience. Let me say it again. God desires and he also expects our obedience. God never, ever asks for our assistance. Never. So, how do I know this? How can I be assured that all God is asking for and wants from us is our obedience to his word, not our assistance? How do I know this? Well, first of all, let's ask Cain. Let's ask Cain. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. Let's read from verse 2 to verse 5. Genesis chapter 4 from verse 2. And she, talking about Eve, again bore his brother Abel. And Abel, the Bible says, was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. What did Cain brought? An offering unto the Lord. Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The Bible says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, God had no respect whatsoever. Cain, he was very angry, and his countenance, his face just fell. So here we're seeing Cain brought an offering of fruit, from the ground, he brought it to the Lord. What was it called? It was an offering. I mean, come on, God, be reasonable. He, he prays bringing an offering to you. What is wrong with that? Come on, cut him some slack. Cain brought an offering to God. But God did not respect Cain's offering. Now, the text does not tell us exactly, you know, why Cain's offering was displeasing to God. You know, but the beauty about line upon line and precept upon precept, we can go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, where the Hebrew writer there gives us a little insight. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the Hebrew writer says, By faith, hmm, you read it for yourself. Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Keyword, how did he offer it? By faith. Hmm. By faith. Hmm. Yeah, by faith. Faith. How do we get faith? Well, you go to the book of Romans, chapter 10 and verse 17, and we learn what? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing what? God's word. Well, I'll just leave you with that for now. Let's go back to Genesis. What we do learn from Genesis is that God thus care how we honor him. Does he? Yeah. God cares how we choose to glorify him. He cares about it. That's what we're learning. Just because we call something an offering to the Lord, it doesn't mean he's going to accept it. But if we offer it by faith, like Abel, of course he's going to accept it. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing what? 
what God has said in the matter. Going back to scripture. Going back to scripture. How do I know God wants obedience, not assistance? Not only must we ask Cain, but let us also ask Mr. Uzzah. We're going to 1 Chronicles, get out of Genesis, jump up to Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 13 from verse 6 to verse 11. We're going to learn there, for those who are not familiar with it, I know many people are very much familiar with it, who are listening to me right now. Well, let's look at, you know, Mr. Uzzah. U-Z-Z-A. 1 Chronicles 13 from verse 6. The Bible says, And David went up, and all Israel, to Bela, that is, Kejat Jura, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwell between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. Verse 7. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadad, and Uzzah, and Heio, he, Jove, both of them drove the cat. David and all Israel played before God with all their might, with the singing and the harp and the spouse trees, the timbrel, the cymbals, the trumpets. And when they came onto the threshing floor of Sidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Verse 10 says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, killed him. Why? Because he had put his hands to the ark, and there he died before the Lord. Verse 11 said, David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So here we see David moving the ark of God to Jerusalem. In order to get the job done, they place it on a cart. Two guys decide that they're going to take responsibility you know, to transport it. Uzzah and Ael, men of Judah. These men were driving the cart. It stumbled, looked as if things were going to fall. As a, out of the kindness of his heart, can't allow the ark of God to fall, he chose to touch the ark, and God struck him dead. Some assistance, please. God don't need our assistance. Some assistance, please. God don't need our assistance. He don't need our assistance. In his mind, A, I am serving God. David and everybody else there, they, they all thought they were serving God. But just because we think we are serving God, again, it doesn't mean that God is going to accept it. Again, he expects our obedience. Line up and line. You go back to Numbers 4 and verse 15, and there we saw that Aaron and his sons had finished covering and all holy objects and all their equipments, and as their camp is ready to move, the Kehotites shall come and do the carrying. Those are the guys. But they must not touch the holy object or they will die. They are the transportation duties of the Kehotites regarding the tents of meeting. That was their duty. You go to Deuteronomy 10 and you look at verse 8. And Deuteronomy 10 verse 8 says, at that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. This is in the law. To stand before the Lord to serve him and to pronounce blessing in his name as they do to this day. That's in the law. That was written in the law. Are you telling me David didn't know this? It was right there. So later in First Chronicles, going back to First Chronicles now, later in First Chronicles chapter 15, David got the message loud and clear. First Chronicles 15, look at verse 1 and verse 2. David made him houses in the city of David 
and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched it for a tent. Verse 2 says, Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. But the Levites. For them had the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. That is what was written in the law of Moses. That is what God expected of all of Israel when it comes to the transportation of the ark of God. Only the Levite. But here is Mr. Uzzah. It's going to fall. Let me render some assistance. Anything wrong with that? Of course nothing is wrong with that. The only thing was wrong with that, he was not authorized to touch it. And even though we're being kind, we're being sincere, we're being generous, whatever. Again, when it comes to the service of God, he wants our obedience, not our assistance. So we see it with Cain. We've seen it with Uzzah. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 3. And I want us to ask Nebad and Abihu. What is God is, what is God asking for? Obedience or assistance? Obedience or assistance? Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 3. Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire, the Bible says, before the Lord which he commanded them not. Leviticus 10, verse 1. Verse 2 says, And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. They died before the Lord. Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctifying them that come nigh to me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, here they were ministering in the tabernacle of the Lord. And these two guys, these two brothers, decide to make one small change. One small change. They wanted to glorify, they wanted to worship God and they choose to do it by offering or by using now strange fire. And in an instant, just like that, they were devoured by fire from heaven. Moses turned to his brother Aaron and said, this is the lesson. This is what God wants you to know. This is what God is teaching. What's the lesson? By those who come near to me, I must be regarded as holy. As holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. So here we are today, and we're calling something fellowship. We slap on the name evangelism. We slap on glorifying God. Does that mean God is going to accept it? You know, we put on all these trimmings. You know, we call it gospel. We call it worship. We call it praise. Some nice sounding fanciful word. Nice sounding fanciful word. Does that mean God is going to accept it? Yes, we are gospel fed. Well, they call it gospel fed. Gospel, you know, dance, praise, team. And we're just glorifying God, aren't we? Yeah, we're glorifying God. I mean, seriously, how can there be anything wrong with any of that? That's our reasoning. After all, as long as we are honoring and we're glorifying God, does he really care what we do? That's the question. Does God really care? Or is it that you and I just have you know, our own whim for our fans? Whatever we please. Just do what we like. Just offer it to God and... You know, hey, come on, he's going to accept it because I'm doing it in his name. I am glorifying God by my actions, by my behavior, by my carrying on. This is all in God's name. This is all for God. 
And hey, you're going to have to accept it. You're going to have to accept it. And yet, the scripture is clear. Ask Cain. Just ask him. Ask Uzzah. Ask Nidav and Abihu. And so many other examples in scripture. So many other examples in scripture. And we are ever learning and still have not come to terms with the truth of God's word. We're allowing the devil and all kind of religious leaders in our world today to just bamboozle and fool us into thinking that what we're doing in God's name is all well and good and God is going to accept it. And later down we hear Jesus, you know, just giving us some insight. Hey, you thought that you were serving God, but all you were doing was practicing lawlessness. Just practicing lawlessness. I only talk that St. Vincent, uh, Vincent is not a lawless nation. We are people who break the law, but we're not a lawless nation. But when it comes to religion, I can safely say that. And I had the word of God to back me up. So many religious people just practicing lawlessness. Just practicing iniquity. I mean, how can there be anything wrong with any of that? Again, after all, as long as we are honoring and glorifying God, I mean, why should God care what we do, what we call this institution and call that organization and how we worship it and how we praise it? Why should God care about that? I mean, just knock ourselves out. Just do as we please. You see, but we have to ask ourselves. We have to come to terms with it and be serious and be honest about it. Are we really honoring and glorifying God just because we classify it that way? Are you telling me I could just come and offer you anything and you'll accept it, whether you ask it for ask for it or not? Seriously? Now if that can't work with you and I, somehow we just have the audacity to believe that you know it is going to work with God. He went through all of that trouble, for want of a better word, to bring to us, thus said the Lord, to bring to us scripture, to bring to us his word. And we are going to just throw that aside and do as we please and say, hey, God, you take this. This is yours. This is to glorify you. This is to honor you. And he's going to say, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. What he's asking for is our obedience. He don't need our assistance. God don't need our assistance. So, come next week, God's willing. Does God care? Does God care? That's what we're going to explore. That's what I want us to continue to see. And later on, we're going to get into a study of the book of Jonah to show exactly what we're talking about and how we are today run away from our responsibility to serve God as he really wants us to. My name is Ron Hector, and I thank you for your time. See you next week, God's willing. Thank you. Bird is a lamp to my feet and the